All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Look, we feel like it's been longer than a week since we've done this show live. Has it been longer than a week? I can't remember. Uh, welcome to PT Pinecast. Hey, before we get started, going to dig into some really cool stuff about eSport today. i uh, got a couple of experts on the show. I know we've been having uh, some questions via Facebook, via Twitter. We're going to get to some of those. But if you have any questions or comments live during the broadcast, uh, please interrupt. That's what we're asking you to do below. Uh, drop a question, drop a comment whenever you would like to interact. Uh, do you want to say thanks to our friends from cbdrx That is your CBD store. Just get the ABCs of CBD. We were just having this discussion the other day about how people are using this over the counter. What is that going to do to their course of treatment? Do you know? Do you know exactly? Do you know 100%? Uh, we've got a physician in charge. We're actually going to do an episode with their physician in charge of CBDRX for you. Uh, your CBD store tomorrow on the program. Also, uh, MW Therapy, have your EMR costs just grown out of control? Was your EMR designed like in 2005 when smartphones weren't even a thing? It's time for something better, time for something customizable. Enter MW Therapy. Take a demo, no strings, at mwtherapy.com, where switching your EMR is easy. I know that that's typically a pain point. People are like, dude, I'm so embedded in my EMR. There's no way I'm switching. They've they've got a they've got to wait an easy way for that. So mwtherapy.com. Uh, Esport. I'm excited. Don't keep your mouths shut. And uh, well, let's start this. Thing. All right, and away we go. Welcome to PT Pinecast. I'm Jimmy McKay. I'll be your host tonight. We like to say uh, the show is great physical therapy conversations on tap, and I think we're over-delivering. Uh, on the socials, at PT Pinecast, that's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Subscribe to the show. We mentioned uh, a few weeks back that there was an iOS update, and some of you who were subscribed to the program might not be subscribed anymore. So make sure you, you click in that top right-hand corner if you're using the uh, Apple Podcast app. We're, we're found wherever good podcasts are uh, are found. Also, we're found where mediocre podcasts are located as well. We don't discriminate. Um, and uh, as we mentioned earlier, questions, comments, feel free to drop those below. As Anthony is saying, he's watching this live. He's making sure Salvatore uh salvador is uh is 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 getting tagged in this as well so don't be shy feel free to jump in on this tonight we've got a physical therapist and co-owner and esports medicine director of one hp on the show and uh founder of gamer doc and licensed physician in the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation both co-editors of the handbook of esport medicine and serve for the annals of esport research they literally wrote the book on this so if, i mean Think about the street cred or the online cred that's going to go with this. If you're like, I mean, how many times would you cite yourself if you wrote the book on something that you're in? I would do it multiple times a day. I would just troll people online and wait to cite myself. But let's get them in here. Uh, Dr. Kate McGee and Gamer Doc, welcome to the show. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for having us. How's it going? As we pipe in our own. The crowd goes wild. I just got the name of the, the pie. I've only seen it written and I never heard there it out loud we go. before. So yeah. get it. Also, Jimmy, yeah. gonna be honest, uh the the citing the the textbook thing, I'd put in a submission for a research conference that like included some stuff that was related to what we wrote about in the textbook. And like one of the reviewer comments that came back was uh I'm concerned that some of the information contained in the abstract of this presentation uh is very similar to a book that has come out too recently for the presenters of this uh, program to have read. And then they cited my textbook and I got to reply, I wrote the damn book. It was great. That is fantastic. There was a, there was a tweet going around for a woman who I think worked in like NASA or something like that. It was like, uh, somebody was like, you need to read, read like Smith at all. And she like moved her hair. She's like, I am Smith at all. Like, yeah. think about that flex. Really like, she'd be like, I am that person and what what do you think that person did like they're just like the homer simpson meme where they just kind of disappear into the bush <laughs> he probably doubled down probably I mean, distinct he possibility probably just... that the reviewer in mine was blinded and was actually like being very considerate mm. and making sure nobody was like you know okay. like writing my work but okay. it was still pretty great let's pretend that the world is nice and normal and those people do that all right well to be a hopeless optimist Lindsay, i appreciate you figuring out the name of the show and why we call it pintcast because 
physical therapy conversation. So that's okay. That's all right. First question is always the hardest. We ask uh, people, uh, what are we drinking tonight? What's on, what's on tap for you? Uh, I'm just drinking water. Okay. <laughs> I'm just He's kidding. Fancy, this is a vodka oxygen. soda. There you go. <laughs> sip and sip. And Kate, what do you got? Uh, so two of my friends who just got married over the pandemic started making and bottling their own seltzers and ciders. So I've got a tart apple seltzer. Well played. I'm doing the slightly mighty IPA. It's low cal, but you still want to pretend that you're cool and hip and you drink IPA. So this Can't is do dogfish, this dogfish head. This is lighter and it is a low cal IPA, but it is a little bit lighter. It's not as heavy. So uh, cheers, ladies, no matter cheers, ladies, no matter what we're drinking. Uh, welcome to the show. Cheers. Thanks to our friends from Owens Recovery Science uh, for bringing you the first round. They're a single source for. Uh, uh, people who are looking for personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. BFR, as the cool kids are are calling it. Uh, find Johnny on his own podcast. This guy's everywhere. You just get a lecture for APTA and their centennial on BFR at owensrecoveryscience.com. Uh, so we mentioned in the intro, guys literally wrote the book on this. So walk me through the arc. Like, think about you're writing the book on a topic that, I don't know, Kate, when were we standing at World of Beers like four or five years ago? That and was, let's see. It would have been like a year after I was at VXC. So this was probably like 2016. Uh, wow. so not too long after I'd started doing the whole esports thing. Before actually Matt and I were doing 1HP. Um, it was after you did the Marymount thing. Right. We had uh, done We had done like a birthday July party. The podcast. Podcast at, at Marymount. Yeah. That was our one year birthday. So let me give the audience some stats because you were throwing some statistics at me that, that night. I was. Uh, over 450 million viewers worldwide, over a billion in revenue, and that's in 2019. So we know we're probably well beyond that because we weren't doing a whole lot in 2020. So I'm guessing people were doing things that they could do on their own in their own homes. Um, and that's what I'm describing, you know, competitive video gaming known more popular, popular as eSport, not a fad. Although I remember, I think in our discussion in 2016, I had said one of the ESPN commentators had just made a comment saying like, this isn't a, you know, this is a game, not a sport. And we were having that discussion. I thought it was it. And that guy doubled down repeatedly. And I don't know where that guy is now, but he's not. I just saying team. that ESPN's PT, Stefania Bell, is on our side with esports is, in fact, actually a sport that people should pay attention to. Yes. We've got absolutely. the most important person at ESPN on our side. All right. So why the need for the book? And we'll put the link uh, for the Amazon link right now, because I know there are people that are looking for this. I was having we were having a discussion uh, at Mount Sinai in the Abilities Research Center mm -hmm working on a project that I can't talk about yet, but it involves eSport. And we were talking, I was like, hey, I'm interviewing two of the people who literally wrote, quite literally wrote the book on this and it's brand new. So walk me through like, you know, why why did it need to exist? And then how do you go about encompassing a brand new field in a, I mean, writing the guide for it? Don't look at me. Yeah, You, was you were here first. Hey. Yeah, you started the book, though. You started esports medicine, though. Okay, fine. Um, so, Lindsay and I have both been... Actually, so the first time I met Lindsay uh, was online. And the first time I met her in person, I was doing tournament coverage at Xanadu, uh, which is a really awesome, like, little... Not even little anymore. It's a decent-sized gaming land center up here in Maryland. Um, and Lindsay was like, can I come shadow you for a day? And I was like... I have no guarantee how many patients I'm actually going to see, but sure, come on up. I spent like the whole day chatting. Um, you also met Sharpie, and Sharpie is also great. Mm -hmm. um, we got Mexican and, food. Yes, we did also get good food. Um, so, oh, and was that the time that there was? That was not the time there was a crab thrown. Um, that was that was a different tournament, Maryland. Uh, but that was when that. Lindsay and I first met and realized that we we both lived in the same area. Um, I was super excited that there was anybody else in esports medicine. Um, particularly excited that there was another woman in esports medicine because like seriously there were like four people and I was the only girl that I knew of at the time so it was pretty great to have another woman in esports medicine can and I just jump in really quickly too mm -hmm. so when I um, realized that I hated traditional medicine and was like looking for a career path where I wasn't going to get mansplained all day every day I was like, I thought of esports medicine, and I swear to God, just like any other doctor in the history of the world, my ego was so big, I thought I made it up. And I was like, I made this up. And so I'm like, 
figuring out this career path and I Google it and it's like, Kay McGee has been doing this for five years. And I'm like, I need to know who this woman <laughs> is and I need to be her friend. So yeah. Fast forward, that's now we're friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I love, I love do you want to talk a little bit stories. about like, what the process was like actually getting the book off the ground and the process of pitching it and all? Well, wait, go go back, though, because I want to talk about, all right, so now you guys are friends, right? We got the origin story. This is like the oh, buddy yeah. comedy. This is where the two buddies meet, and they're like, mm-hmm. I want to be your best friend. Well, I want to be your best friend. And um, and now you're saying, like, uh, did it start, like, you know, on the back of a napkin? Like, hey, I Googled. There's no book. Like, should we? Should we write a book? I don't know. Should we? Like, how did it go to where, like, yes, we are going to plant our flag in this, and we're going to do this damn thing? My wife was out of town. And I was playing video games and you know how when you play video games and you have a to-do list, you start to feel guilty, but you don't want to do your to-do list. So you do something else that's kind of productive. Yes. I was like, I'm going to write a book. So I got like a chapter in and I was like, I can't do this by myself. I was like, who's the only person (laughs) in the entire world that I wanted, I would want to do this with. Oh, it's Kate McGee. So I called Kate. I was like, you want to write a book? She's like, hell yeah. I already have like a couple chapters written. And I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> well, like I, I'd always wanted to do something like this, but I had, I'm really good at like logistics and details and like fine print This is stuff. true. And Lindsay is really great at like big picture and ideas and outreach. And it was like, perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's great. But so you, so you guys were both secretly writing the, I mean, you had said you're trying to avoid your to-do list and you wrote a chapter and Kay was mm-hmm. like, I'm already kind of doing this. Mm-hmm. So there, there it is. All right. So there's the synthesis. Like, obviously it needs to exist because uh, you each separately invented a sport or a field of, of medicine, yeah, which is e-sport medicine. And I'll tell people all the time, like, if it doesn't exist, just look like, are there people there? Are they doing something that requires moving? Well, chances are there needs to be someone in rehabilitation and yep. human performance there. So good for good on you guys for doing it. So where where'd that go? So they get a couple chapters <laughs> together and like how does that how does something go from like we should write a book to like a book? So we reached out to some people to contribute chapters. And we <laughs> set deadlines and we found a, another editor, Dr. Melita Moore who was more like the last author, you know, on like a paper. And we were finishing chapters and and finishing books. And Kate's like, oh, by the way, who's our publisher? Uh, I was like, what do you mean? She's like, who's our publisher? I was like, well, don't we have to finish the book first? She's like, no, you, you, you submit a book. We don't have a, we don't have a publisher. (laughs) We'd mostly written the book already. And we were like, we need a publisher. So I thought you were supposed to write the book and then submit it to a publisher. I didn't know anything about book. Pro- I'm just like, let's do this. Let's write a book. No one's holding me back. I'm writing. I mean, a honestly, book. you can do it either way, really. Yeah. So we submit. We I we looked up who the number the one and number two medical textbook publishers were, and we submitted to both of them. And um, we absolutely you, I, assumed that neither of them would take it, and we'd have we'd end up going with like a tier two one, and like you know, but they'd at least give us useful feedback for it. Melita was like, let's just self publish, and both of them responded, and we're like, we're interested. Yep. <laughs> and it was Springer and Elsevier. And we were like, right? shit. They're like, they're legit. That's who you get in class and who you get journals yeah, through. Yeah, so yeah. All right. So, so let's go to the inside, right? Um, who's this for? Why do they need it? What do they get out of it when they pick this up and when they bring it into their practice? I mean, really, this is for anybody who wants to work in esports medicine and functionally needs a crash course in it. Um, some of it was... Like there are absolutely things we wrote in there to basically bust myths and assumptions about what goes on in esports. Like we we talk about carpal tunnel because of course we talk about carpal tunnel and we talk about all the other wound injuries that we treat. Uh, you know, because it's not just carpal tunnel in esports, amazingly. And we talk about like uh, athlete culture um, and kind of like the thoughts and belief patterns that shape how esports competitors think about gaming. Lindsay did this really awesome chapter about like some of the like difficulties of working with esports competitors. One of which was, and I cite this all the time, um, about how like in traditional sports, right? Like even if you never got injured, you saw one of your teammates get injured, go through a rehab process, come back to playing. It's not a thing in esports. There's not a developmental league. You don't see that happen. So you don't have this concept that an injury is something that can be rehabbed and recovered from. You just see what? Someone just drop off and and you don't know what happens or what what do you mean? No, no, you don't hear about injuries and they're retiring because the injury is too bad. Got it. That's, That's mostly when you hear about injuries. So like- this is for anybody who wants to work with the esport athlete and not only mm-hmm. understand the physical needs, but also like kind of the psych performance and culture needs. 
because there's definitely a need for, for more rehab specialists of all varieties, PTs, OTs, ATCs, kinesiologists, chiropractors, even physiatrists, absolutely registered dietitians, uh, anybody who works in like the mental side of performance. There's absolutely a need for really skilled professionals who really care about this to be there. And there's kind of this daunting hurdle of how do I start? Like probably the over the past five years, if I had to summarize like the two most common emails I receive, it's this thing hurts. Can you help? And how do I do esports medicine? And like before even do esports medicine thing with the thing, it was like, how do I do PT on esports people? And, you know, sometimes my answer is something along the lines of uh, I started writing ergonomics guides and then treating people. I don't have a great on ramp for you here. So let's try and make an on ramp that actually helps. I mean, when you know you've got an intersection is your two most frequently asked questions to to you are, um, I'm getting hurt doing this. And how do I help people who are getting hurt doing this? Like what if there was a first, the people together. Yeah. I mean, I think there's your proof of concept. Uh, as Spencer chimes in saying, shout out for not forgetting ATs. I mean, if, th if this isn't a great example, I'm guessing of just um, interprofessional collaboration, nothing is, right? It's also like, and so, so as PTs, uh, right, our, our license, our education makes us autonomous practitioners capable of practicing autonomously, although there are definitely restrictions and limitations around that, you know, it's like uh, terms and conditions may apply. Um, and one of the things that we frequently run into is MDs and DOs, not necessarily thinking of PTs as, you know, a similarly autonomous practitioner. Uh, Lindsay, who is a DO, um, has literally never treated anyone in medicine as though like their degree makes them less capable or competent than her with the exception of like the bullshit medical degrees that are like Ayurvedic medicine. Or, wait, wait, like, except for that, she just I, named it by I, name. I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying names. Look, I didn't say any names, Lindsay. I just said practices. Well, I mean, Kay, you're smarter than me. I mean, I, I've known that since the day I met you. It's there's no. Uh, Will you stop underrating your smarts already? No, I know how smart I am, but you're still smarter than me. So, I mean, I don't think I don't think the stuff after our name is more of a reflection of our influences early in life, privilege, and our financial background, and less of a reflection of our aptitudes and capabilities. I, I think the reason why I left traditional medicine is because they're all a bunch of assholes and I wanted to come to a place where people respected each other mutually. And it wasn't this whole hierarchical thing. Like people who cool. like my, my, my colleagues who only wore white coats, even when it was like one in the morning and they were coming out of bed, they'd pull on their white coat. It's like, if you need a white coat to be respected, you're not doing a very good job being a doctor. Yep. So I, I, that's my that's my thought process on that. So, Kate, sorry to interrupt you, but no, the good interruption. Yeah, <laughs> we just found the clip that's going to be used to promote this episode. That's it. If you don't have have a better just mic drop than that, it really is a good line. Awesome. Keep that one. Um. So so uh, when it, when it first came out, and you guys both have copies of the book, and you and it lands in your hand, how does that feel? Emotionally, I mean, that's a lot of work put in to actually hold the handbook of esport medicine. Uh, I cried. Yeah, it was bit. it was a lot because Kate and I, like we said, we had it finished for like a year. Yep. Um, it was done. And then we found a publisher and they sent it back to us for edits. We made some edits and then sent it back to us. And we said, this is great. Can, you, do can you double this? And we're yeah. like, OK, how much time? They're like a month. We're like, OK, sure, cool. sure. So it's all in Google Docs, right? And like Google Drive and it's done, but it's, it's, it doesn't exist anywhere. I mean, it exists. It's and real. So, um, what, ha what had happened was, what happened? um, I was at a party at my friend's house and I had asked my wife to bring over the books cause I know they had been delivered that day. And I was a little tipsy. Um, and a little side note is if you open the book and uh, the dedication, it says dedicated to Stella and bossy girls. And Stella was my grandmother. Um, huh. she didn't know that this was going to be dedicated to her. I wanted it to be a surprise. And she passed a couple weeks before the book came out. Um, so I get the book and or, so, so I'm at the party. My wife forgot to bring the box over, but the box arrived to that house because it was the place that I had lived previously. So I open the book, I turn it to that first page and I look at her name and I just started like losing my mind like oh. i don't cry i don't cry and i was just lost it 
that's so, uh, that's a really uh that's a that's a story. Yeah, Anna would be proud. Yeah. yeah. Well, kudos to both of you guys and everybody else who uh, who helped. Uh, question from the audience right now. This one's from Dave. Is the book something that is it more of a reference or something to read or a mix of both? A little bit of both. Um, yeah. So it's so you can see size wise, it is it is a handbook. It is not like a heavy duty dense like. What have I got here? Um, I've got one of my orthopedic textbooks. Ugh. It's not an it's not you know an, an orthopedic physical assessment. Yes, I happen mm -hmm. to have that on hand. It is a handbook. It is handbook sized. Um, so it's absolutely something you can sit down and read and get a lot out of, but it's also not going to take over your life to read it. And it's easy enough to like, you know, go and check specifically like, okay, I suspect the patient has this thing going on. Let me brush up on it. And like, you know, you can flip to the page on like, yeah. beep, radial styloid tenosynovitis. Or if you're saying, hey, what, you know, what, what are, what is the latest or what are the guidelines on uh, sleep or nutrition? You've got that covered as well. Yeah. You can yeah. go, you can thumb to that. It's definitely different chapter by chapter too, right? So there are certain chapters like the intro chapter or the injury prevention chapter, the ch chapter Kate wrote on cultural competency that are easier to read as someone who wants to not just read a textbook. So those are the chapters, and you can easily tell what they are when you get to them. Yeah. And then there's other chapters that are, these are the injuries that you get. This is how to prevent them. Here's how to treat them. So right. Very it really differs. Structure. Yeah. Um, so uh, good good research, good resources, guidelines are evolving rapidly. I'm reading from the uh, from the the anecdote uh, on the website, but this is this is it, right? This is the first big resource, and I mean, now you guys are gonna. No matter what happens after this, you want to be like, well, we did write the book. first book. I don't want to. It's also so ahead. like we we cite a lot in here, but interestingly enough, a lot of what we cite is not games or esports specific research, mostly because there's not a lot of games or esports specific research. Uh, so it's going to be pretty cool that when we inevitably make the second edition of the handbook of esports medicine, we're going to be able to cite a lot more esports yeah. specific research this time around. That's great. All right. So I'm going to throw out some more numbers and I want you to talk about this. This is for people who are watching the audience, rehab professionals, um, players will practice, excuse me, gamers often practice upwards 12 hours a day. Kate, that was something you told me previous. I had no idea performing anywhere from four to 600 actions per minute, right? Okay. So how would you describe an action and then four to 600 of it? Uh, action is push a button, push a key on a keyboard, push a button on the mouse. Um, if you're playing on a controller, it's push a button, move a joystick, um, L cancel, anything like that. That's, that's an action. So every time that finger is moving, that's probably an action. Wow. Four to 600 a minute. So you've got a human being Mm -hmm. And also, we talked about uh, the the positions people will sit in. I've got this weird thing I do with my tongue, where I sort of Michael Jordan it out to the side whenever I'm playing. I don't know how that good is or bad is for me. But people are sitting in these pro law, well, twelve hours. You're going to change posture. Uh, some of it's going to be unique, which I'm sure you guys have stories of people in unique postures doing these things rapidly for twelve hours a day. There's going to be some. There's going to be some stuff. Talk to me about posture because we do have one more question, which in terms of like, hey, gaming chairs, any recommendations? I'm sure that's a frequently asked question as I can yeah. see the look on both of your faces. Um, but talk to me about postures and just things that you've seen because you'll treat people virtually, by the way, ahead of the curve, because I know we were talking about that in 2016. Yeah, you guys are doing that. So what are some things that uh, that come up that you can't wait to tell stories about people that you've worked with uh, in, in eSport? So I had a player who came to me with I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> came to me with uh, arm and shoulder pain um, that was starting to radiate down into the hand. Uh, Non-specific. It was not clearly like ulnar or media nerve. It was just radiating down to the hand, numbness and tingling. Right. That was my first suspicion. It was not the arm over the back of the chair. That was my first suspicion. So like we we do all of you know we go through. I get I get a video of like what his play style looks like. I get to, you know, I have his teammates take pictures of him when he's been playing for a while. So like we get to see him when he's not paying attention to it. I ask him all about, you know, what other things he does outside of gaming, what his sleep habits are like. Um, and like, there is nothing clear that's showing up as a potential mechanism of injury. We start treating and it's, it's going fine. It's basically a thoracic outlet. Um, you know, we start treating for thoracic outlet. We're making improvements. Uh, and like every... Every session or two, I'm still revisiting, like, you know, new ideas I've had of, you know, could this be the thing that's causing it? Could this be the thing that's causing it? Um, and he's mentioning, you know, kind of consistently now that, well, it feels good most of the time, but it feels the worst when I wake up. 
So like I start hammering a little bit more on sleep, like, you know, what kind of pillow do you use? How many pillows are you on your side or on your back or on your front? What's your mattress like? How old is your mattress? I'm asking him about his sleeping position. I ask him a lot about his sleeping position. I'm like, this has to be sleeping position. And he's like, no, I just sleep on my side, you know, normally. Um, and so for all those PTs out there, you know how like they remind you to ask your questions like six different ways so that you can get a good answer from your patients sometimes? Oh, God. I finally ask him very precisely and specifically, what is the position of your arm when you are sleeping? And he demonstrates it for me. The position of his arm is he sleeps on his side like that. Oh, no. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Come on. And I'm like, I think when I know why we've got Jurassic Out going on for you right now. I think we found what happened. I but here think we found the culprit. But you just said, like, you got to ask the same question six different ways because that's that that was that person's normal. Right. And like, we got to think about like, you know, what is normal for them for sure. But also like the things that we think of as normal and abnormal, the things that we think of as pathological and not the things that we think of as obvious and not are very much shaped by our years in school and our years in practice. And that does not mean that it's at all obvious to our patients. And that's true for all of our patients, not just our gamers. Yeah. Gamer Doc, what do you got? Like you were making a face when I asked this question. I feel like you got a, like good ones. You're oh God, no. I just refer them all to Kate. Uh, I mean... <laughs> I I would have stopped after the first iteration of the question and just read referral to PT. Arm is jacked up. <laughs> Please evaluate and treat appropriately. Uh, I Kate does a lot. Kate has a lot more patient experience than I do. I focused a lot more in the past year or so on systems based implementation, uh, content creation. Um, creating curriculum and lessons for other organizations. Um, and then last week I signed on with Evil Geniuses as their oh, yeah. wellness and performance consultant. Nice. Yeah. Um, so once again, I'm, I'm, I'm not really going to be working directly with the players. I'm, I'm creating organizational based practices. So um, like I said, Kate works a lot harder than I do. No, I don't. We work equally hard. So this this feels like um, when I was reading kind of the, the 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 back of the baseball card of 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 the handbook, it felt very much like a, like a mixology guide where you were going to go through because there's a mix of pathologies, right? There's a mix of 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 injuries and disorders from these complex movements, extended twelve hour playing. I mean, what how many what sports are people training for twelve? I mean, Ironman, you don't even train. Great for question, that Jimmy. Long. Great question. Well, it's, it's definitely improving. Like we're yeah. definitely seeing fewer and fewer teams for which that is the norm and the expectation. Yeah. Um, and, and far fewer teams where it's just straight grind for as long as you can. Um, yeah. There was a time when like, that was the model that made the most sense because that was the model that was used by the players who were the most successful. Um, and now that we've got more structure and more organization and more support, then absolutely we're seeing less of that as a need. Uh, but it's kind of hard to shake that as kind of the base assumption that in order to be the best, I have to grind as much as I possibly can. Right. And like you said, the, you, you had, you had gone into this trying to, um, bust a lot of myths. I mean, you're still on, on little league fields trying to bust myths and we're <laughs> how many years past, like, Hey, maybe throwing this many hundred pitches oh my God. five days a week is, is maybe shitty for a nine-year-old. Um, so maybe, these, maybe yeah. it's better for kids if they play a variety of sports and learn to enjoy activity as opposed to being forced to hyper focus on one of them because their parent has unrealized dreams about a baseball career. D1, That's baby. That's really all. Specific. D1 or bust. That's it. That's all I want to know. That's so specific. <laughs> yeah. The number of, like, I, there's a reason I didn't go into peds. And the reason is not that I don't like kids. I love kids because they're adorable. Although I did discover that way too damn many of them are taller than me at like age eight, which I'm not it's okay not hard. with. Okay. Um, thanks, Lynn. Uh, <laughs> it's not hard. I'm short. But like, it's parents. It's it's parents that I don't go into esports mm -hmm. for, or that I didn't go into to peds for. But there's this really cool thing that's been happening in esports over the past year or so. Um, it's some some of it's school based development, you know. Uh, NACEF, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation, and some of its parent-based. There's something called COPE, Coalition of Parents oh, uh, in Esports. I love you, Chris uh, and Shay. Shay and Chris are the best. Um, but it's so we've talked like before in esports medicine how we get a chance to create this infrastructure that works best for us and for the players. We don't just have to mirror what's been done in traditional medicine, which, as Lindsay said, is often full of assholes <laughs> um, and full of things that like aren't optimal, like things that are, yeah. are difficult and hurdles and make it harder for us to work well with our patients. 
uh, like productivity standards and insurance billing. Um, yeah. I, but like we get a chance to build something new there. And so in the same way, parents in esports get a chance to build something new and different that works for them. Like a lot of them may not have, you know, esports specific experience, but they like games and they yeah. love their kids. And these games make their kids happy. So they want to find a way to make it work. So they're finding ways to make it work. I also, I it almost wanna... seems like Go, ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. It's your show. I was going to say, it, it almost, <laughs> you're my guest. So you go. <laughs> I just want to circle back because what, what Kay was saying, like, uh, you can form your own way and create your own path. I think in traditional medicine, it's just, it's so like formulative. Like a person has back pain, counsel them on weight loss, tell them to strengthen their core, send them to PT. If, if they have radiculopathy, let's put them on some gabapentin. Oh, they have kidney failure. Let's put them on Lyrica. Like it's so for like no one's thinking anymore. No one uses their brain. Like we, we think that creativity is so different from a scientific mind when in order to have a scientific mind, you have to be creative. And that's what, you know, going into esports medicine, we, we get to be so creative. Like Something as simple as ergonomics. Like, why did ergonomics get created? It was created to reduce human error. It was created to reduce human error and make it so everything, like pilots wouldn't push the eject button accidentally, right? And so ergonomics in esports, let's reduce human error. Let's If we give them a big cushy seat to sit in, they're going to sit in that seat all the time, right? If, if we give them a bucket chair where their knees are above their hips, they're going to chill like that. Let's reduce human error and create yeah. products for that. And I just love the creativity involved in esports and exactly what Kate was saying. It's also like we get more time. Um, like I think part of the reason why traditional medicine has become so formulaic is the constraints on time, right? Yeah, like totally. even for PTs, like the number of PTs who actually get to see a patient one-to-one -one for a full hour anymore is <laughs> quite low. Um, I mean, same thing goes even more so for, for our friends over on the MDDO side of things, right? Like the amount of time that you get to sit with a patient for more than maybe 15 minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes is a pipe dream. Um, let alone the amount of time you have to spend documenting all of that. So like, you don't have time to be creative. You don't have time to ask the question about sleep position six different ways, because you've only got 20 minutes to get through right. this patient's evaluation. So the fact that we've got more time in esports lets us, I mean, at least for right now, create something that works a lot better. So yeah, it takes more time and effort to be creative. Yeah, it takes more more work in the front end, but it lets us create something that's so much easier and so much more rewarding in the back end. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk about that parallel from from, you know, traditional sports, right? Talk about that little league dad who just pushes 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 his kid and it, it's it's the law of diminishing returns. How is this and then Kate of course not wanting to go into uh, peds because she hates children, but really it's <laughs> I hate parents. That's what I hate. Kids are great. Parents suck. How how is that? Working with, um, you know, let's let's not all. First of all, not all esport athletes are kids, but let's just say if you're working with someone who's younger, how does that parent dynamic come in? Are they? I'm guessing they're not like a traditional push, 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 or are they? Or I don't want to assume what it. How does that come in? What's that dynamic like? I think for right now, or at least in recent history, esports has been a disrespectable enough career that there aren't too many parents who are push, push, pushing their kid to go that direction. Uh, more often, the opposite. The mm. other thing is. One of the hurdles, again, that I ran into with peds was when you're treating an adult patient, right? They look to you as an authority figure on this specific topic. Not that you are an authority on their life. You are an authority on this specific matter. When you are treating a child, you are an authority figure to that child. But the parent is also an authority figure to that child. So the parent perceives that you and them are on the exact same level, which, no, my relationship to your child is different. And my relationship to you is different. And it doesn't mean that one of us is the superior to the other but it also means that you can't contradict my treatment just because you're also an authority to your kid. And so when we're working with younger patients in esports, a lot of the times I'm finding that parents feel new enough or like unconfident enough in this particular arena that they want to listen. They want to learn. There's not quite that instantaneous barrier or resistance to somebody is, is directing my child. It's no, I don't know about this. This is the person to go to about this. I'm going to learn too. And it creates this way healthier dynamic for all of us to work together. That's cool. Um, uh, Gamer Doc, this one's for you. Um, when you're now walking around clearly uh, with copies of the book in my in your bag, because I would be yeah. be like, oh, I'm sorry, have you seen my new book? Um, <laughs> how, how does this uh, how does this is is this looked at when people find out? Hey, this is the area that you've you know helped to invent and create a space and now and now work in. Like, how do colleagues? 
uh, in in you know in medicine react. <laughs> uh, I, like I, got a good one I don't really have any colleagues in medicine right now. Like I um so I give a talk at our everyone has like you guys have what's APTEA like the at you guys have your conference. We have our I have my AAP in our conference. I give a talk in 2018 about esports medicine. And it's a it's a room full of a thousand, more than a thousand physicians. Um, and I started talking about esports medicine and they started laughing. No, seriously. They started laughing and like, whatever. Like I, I roasted them. I, I absolutely roasted them. I was, <laughs> I'm not going to go into that, but, uh, it, that is the approach that are, that my colleagues have about esports medicine. Obviously some people are starting to get it. you got the people at NYID, Haley Zwobel, Joe and Donnie, who you've got the Cleveland clinic, Dominic King, uh, some people at UCI esports as well. But other than that, no one really takes it seriously. Um, and that's because the people in charge are older and they are making their money and they, they have no incentive to change their priorities so it, it honestly like the book would have made a difference I, right. I, I if i still talk to those people but i've largely abandoned like i i in march i sent a payment message i was like hey i have a textbook coming out with springer um these are my credentials like i'm the ed senior editor of a journal like blah, blah 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 and i didn't even i would love to give a talk on esports minutes i didn't even get a response ah oh, got it <laughs> so i mean i'm not gonna you can lead a horse to water. You're doing this thing where if you're creating something new, it means that they were not seeing something previous. Uh, so you you don't uh, you created something new. I didn't overlook anything. So how could I have missed anything? Yeah, so, I, well I think it's interesting. So there's a there, I'm not going to give specifics, but last year something similar happened where I applied to be a part of a, a conference and I didn't get a message back. And and this year I was their keynote. So I'm really looking All forward right. to like two to three years from now, AAP and R coming back to me and me offering them my speaker fee. So. Yes. There you go. And your, and, and your, and your <laughs> I will say that uh, on that list for people who are looking into uh, uh, eSport research, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, where I get there to be part of, uh, of a great team. Uh, oh, yeah. They are very, very excited about that. Uh, yes. A great question from the audience. Chase watching while he's leaguing also wants to know if it's a great opportunity. They see Kate, Kate lighting up there. Any plans for... CEs in the pipeline. I know I, I like this question. I, I, I hate to leave uh, a very vague and mysterious answer, but the general answer is yes. Stay tuned shortly. It's not vague. That's very specific. The yes and yes. stay tuned. Cliffhanger. But Great. yeah, there is, I mean, like we clearly recognize a need for this. Um, we mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're giving the best and most recent information possible. Uh, but yeah. Perfect. Yeah, All right. So two, two more topics I wanted to hit. Um, you had mentioned, Kate, hey, by the time you guys are coming out with the next handbook uh, for esports, there's going to be a lot more research. Mm -hmm. Where is it going? You know, what are the what are the areas that it needs to happen in or or the areas that it's in the works for happening? Where where Where's the research need to be? Everywhere. All of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mostly. So <laughs> that's the short answer. The longer answer is we need prevalence data on injury types. We yes. need diagnostic criteria. We need yes. interventional studies. Um, we need to assess what things are pain patterns that are pathological versus what things are pain patterns that aren't pathological because not all pain is pathological pain. Um, like shout out to the folks over at like the San Diego pain summit for some really fantastic coursework on that. Um, <laughs> but like there's that, there's the, uh, what actually makes performance better in esports competitors. We have theories. They, the athletes have certainly have theories. Most right. of their theories involve caffeine. Uh, they're not entirely wrong about that particular theory, but what amount? In what quantities? How long before they play? What about the effects of exercise? What about the effects of sleep? What about the effects of travel? We need data on all of this. We've got some preliminary data on some of this. Um, but, and uh, I know like spoilers for an episode that's going to be coming up, but we're going to be talking about some of the research that we have done. And I'm going to sum up the two papers that we did as, as basically two different forms of saying, hi, you should fund more research. Feel free to cite our paper when you're putting in your grant application. Uh, that was basically why, I, why we wrote those. Love that. Yes. And I also think like what Kate was saying about inc incidents and prevalence, it's really overlooked in this field because if you wanna figure out how to treat 
football players, you're like, okay, what injuries do football players suffer? And then you get to look at the thousands and thousands and thousands of emergency visits that happen every year because of football injuries that get reported directly into a database. And that's where we get the, we know with football, you get ACL tears, you get concussions. These are all, you get quad contusions. That doesn't happen for esports. So we simply at this point, we know they experience wrist pain. We know they experience hand pain. Why are they having that wrist and hand pain? We have case reports, Yep. right? We don't have anything else. And, and it's hard because you can't, if you want to evaluate esports athletes, you have to evaluate the pros. If you want to check pros for injuries, good luck. Good luck because they're one, they don't know they can get injured. Two, afraid that the arm yeah, pain they have that. is cancer, you know, and, and three, are afraid they're going to lose their starting spot if you touch yep. them. So yep. it's very hard to get data. We want basic, basic data at this point. Um, any, any, we, you know, case reports are great. Surveys are great. Right? That's start. what we have. They're a start, but we need more. Yeah. Good. It's part of why I'm so excited about all of the collegiate esports programs that are coming out because hello, college esports population. You are a captive population <laughs> research. I mean, not just captive population, but like they're they're in an area where like there's not that fear that you're going to lose your right. paid job, your whole career if you report an injury. Right. There is, in fact, an assumption you might get treated for it. Um, so we get, you know, kind Imagine. of one of the big barriers to entry out of the way when it comes to research. Um, obviously Mount Sinai is doing some good stuff. Um, NYIT is doing some fantastic stuff. Ryerson university up in Canada is also doing some really great stuff. Um, they've got a lab called the conduit setup where they're starting to look into the effects of like haptic feedback on posture change. Um, which is like letting us do stuff like, I mean, so the thing with research is we have to answer the questions that we know the answer is obvious to, but we need to prove it in data. So like, does one specific posture cause more back pain than another specific posture? Or is back pain more related to just not friggin' moving? It's, it's the second, it's most of the second one. Um, if we show that, you know, not moving very much is related to back pain, can we then also prove that moving more decreases back pain? Okay, if we've proven that moving more decreases back pain, how do we prove that this intervention is effective at getting players to move more? Mm -hmm. Like that's how the research builds on itself. But because there isn't an available body of research for esports, we need to like take five steps back from our from our ideal premise, which would be how do I look at what improves performance in esports competitors and go all the way back to what's my metric for performance in esports player? Is it a specific mechanic in game? Is it something that I can check from the API of the game? Is it total wins? Is it wins on LAN? Is it wins online? Is it wins in this specific construct? Is it wins on this specific role in this specific game? And what game? What game? What game are we talking about? What is it's not well, a yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we need to take like five steps back with our research and start at the very, very basic stuff so that we can build on all the useful and informative stuff. It's nobody wants to do that though because it's it's a little bit boring. Do also, three. sounds like you guys have thought about this. Just it's in the book too. A little bit. A bit. Oh God, yeah. No, we have a whole thing on current research and and what we need. All right. What surprised you? I'm going to ask you this question to each of you. What surprised you the most? about putting a land I'm going to call this a landmark piece of literature out there when you when you kind of invent a space and you write the handbook for it what surprised you the most let's go to well you whoever wants to go first I got to think I'm still I think, over time I think how easy it was to do like it, it just required hard work right it didn't require luck it didn't require me knowing someone at Springer. It didn't require us to even have that many papers to pull from. Like, we're very honest in the book that, like, we don't know if this is true. We have no very data. limited this data on this. Eventually observed. By the time this book gets published, it's going to be three years later. Like, so I think it was surprising to me how we, all you got to do, like, if you want to do something, we all like are just walking around believing our own excuses that like, we're not going to get this because of X, Y, Z factors. So we're not even going to apply for the job. Or we're not going to be able to get this for X, Y, Z factors. So we're not going to ask that person out on a date. When in reality, all you got to do is like actually shut up and do the thing. And then it, it's going to happen. Right. So it was once we did the thing, then everyone was like, yeah, we'll publish your book. I'm like, what? 
Right. Like I got to, we, we negotiated our contract. We did. Like we, we got more money from them than oh, they yeah, were no, willing they, to give. They came to us originally with like, you know, Hey, we'll pay you a flat fee of this. And our yeah, response yeah, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. we would like royalties instead. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, mm-hmm. I think that at the end of the day, uh, like the lesson from this is like, I don't think Kate and I seem particularly like intimidating or um, per, like aggressive or anything, but like we wrote a book you can write a book. Write, a book. write the book. You know, write the book. What write are you waiting book. for? Get your, just stop doing your to do list and write, start write chapter one of the book. Exactly. Ignore your to do list and write the first chapter. Get drunk. Of the book. Tell your wife to leave town. Write the book. <laughs> Kate, most surprising. What was it? Was that was that it too, or do you have something different? It really was. Like, like we go through school right with these absolutely massive textbooks with you know these these kind of giants of our field and even our professors oftentimes are giants of our field like for crying out loud i had lynn snyder mackler as a professor she did my entry interview do you know how intimidating that is when lynn snyder mackler does your interview for pt school it was terrifying and we mostly talked about the musical cats um (laughs) i'm gonna lie love her already but like we go through like all of this schooling, thinking of the people who wrote these textbooks as inaccessibly brilliant and competent in ways that we cannot possibly be. And all that it took was knowing enough about the thing to write the damn book, uh, to, to do the damn thing. Um, and it's it doesn't make me feel any different. I don't suddenly feel like a titan of industry. I, I don't feel like, you know, I'm, you know, any taller at all <laughs> uh, you know i don't i don't feel like there's any anything that's changed about me which makes me think that well maybe it was entirely possible but it was entirely possible for us to do this all along we just had to do the damn thing <laughs> and stop getting in our own way it reminds me like the the Ron, roger banister the, the guy who was the first person to break the four minute mile was like it's impossible it's impossible hey this banister guy did it and then like six more people did it in the next 18 months it was like yeah. no so not really impossible no it's not it's in, it's incredible how much our minds can get our get in our own way yeah, totally. I love that. All right, so that's your surprising moment brought to you by uh, Physical. Um, they are uh, an organization that uh, seeks to put physical therapists in charge of their own physical therapy practice. If you're ready to discover how the largest network of PT private practice owners are growing and adapting to industry changes, visit physicalfranchise.com. That's physicalfranchise.com, F-Y-Z-I-C-A-L. And on average, a private practice who joins physical grows more than 40%. And you retain 100% of your practice, which is always good as well. All right. Are you guys ready to do three questions? I'll do three questions. Let's do three questions. As a physical therapist, you have a unique set of skills, your in-depth medical knowledge, fine touch, and confidence. You're sure to make a huge impact on your patients' recoveries and long-term care, but what about where your where your career is? Move forward in your travel physical therapy career wherever you want to go at Fusion Med Staff. That's uh, FusionMedStaff.com. Leaders in hashtag, uh, hashtag, I can say that again, hashtag travel PT. Again, FusionMedStaff.com. So first question on three questions, ladies, is a where question. Uh, where is somewhere you can't wait to go uh, on vacation, travel to a conference to roast people, wherever that might be? Uh, Kate, we'll start with you. Where's your where? Where's somewhere you just can't wait to go to? I cannot wait to finally, once this pandemic is gone enough that it is safe to travel, even with my vaccination status being fantastically good, uh, I can't wait to get to Ireland. Um, oh, yeah. it's, uh, with a name like Caitlin McGee, it might be a little bit obvious that I'm possibly Irish. Oh, sure. <laughs> so I'd really love to get there someday. Perfect. All right. Uh, Gamer Talk, where are we going? I want to go to board game night at Kate's partner's house. Get up here. Yeah. Done. Board game night. I love that. All right. Second been question. Talking about it for months. I need to get. <laughs> second question is a what question, um, and I'll I'll add a fourth category. Usually, I say what book, movie, or podcast would do you think the audience would get something out of? But I'll say also book, movie, podcast, or a uh, video game or or game title. What's something you think the audience should jump into? The Gary V audio experience. Oh yeah, Gary V always dropping knowledge in his podcast. Every, I I listen to that man. He says the same thing over and over again. I listen. To, I learn something every single time. Tells you the whole time. He's like, I'm going to repeat myself. And if you sh- if you don't want to buy the book, don't because I'm just going to say it in my podcast. But then what do I do? I pre-order the book. Yep. 
Why not? Uh, Kate, what's your uh, book, movie, podcast, game? What do you got? So book that absolutely was like mind-blowingly fantastically good for me is not one book, but a trilogy. Um, yeah. It's a fiction trilogy. It's not going to you know, advance your practice or anything. It's just going to like make your mind go, oh my God, this is amazing. Uh, it is the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. The first one in it is The Stone Sky. And it was the first book I've read in a solid decade that had a twist I didn't see coming. Ooh, I like oh, I that. Love that. Did you see the twist in um, uh, M. Night Shyamalan? Did you see which, that one? Which one? That old? Uh, I see dead people. Oh, oh yes. no. You did see that twist? I didn't see it coming. That didn't book's see. arriving Ooh. tomorrow. I just ordered it off Amazon. Dude got gut shot. Of course, or he got stabbed. Nice. All right. Uh, last question on three questions is a who question. Who is the audi uh, Who is someone the audience should know more about? Like who does? Who's doing great work, but more people should know about them. I'm gonna say Daniel Bonner. Uh, he is a clinical psychologist. He's from Australia. Um, caveat: He is. He does work for One HP, so I know him, and he's fantastic. Um, but he specializes in sleep, um, like sleep psychology. Uh, which is like the single most underrated way to improve your performance is actually get better sleep. Like there's serious research on it, not just in esports. There was a really great research study on Duke basketball players when they were assigned to get nine hours of sleep a night instead of just however many they normally get. Uh, their reaction times improved, their focus improved, and their injuries dropped by like 25%. Yeah. Um, so his research, uh, which is some of the early research that's out there in esports, specifically on sleep and esports, and now he's looking into caffeine and sleep and esports, um, is really fantastic. And more people should follow his stuff. He's <clears throat> Daniel underscore Bonner two on Twitter. It's the basics. Do the basics well and stick to them. All right, so gamer talk. Who, who's your who? Uh, Dr. Wayne Mackey, the owner of State Space and the genius behind Aim Lab. Dude is a is a neuroscientist, one of the smartest dudes I've ever met in my entire life. Humble, so down to earth, is doing amazing things with gaming and doesn't want anyone to know what he's th that he's behind it. Love. Did it. he Love tell it. you his story about why he got tattoos? No. Okay, so Maybe. so Dr. Mackey has lots of tattoos. Um, he's got like two full sleeves, I think. And he doesn't want you to call him Dr. Mackey. He wants you I to know. call him Wayne. Wayne, sorry. Wayne wears, Wayne has full sleeves. Uh, Wayne is a absolutely genius, bonkers genius doctor, um, PhD. And he got tattoos in part because as a kid, he overheard some mom oh, yeah, no, you're how right. unprofessional and, you know, like uh, how dumb, you know, somebody must be to have all those tattoos. And so me over here with my full sleeve, Lindsay over there with all her ink, Wayne with his, you know, full sleeves as well. Um, Wayne wanted to get tattoos to be like, I can be an absolute genius and also have tattoos all over the place. Amazing. There's no crossover. That's the ultimate. You know what? I'm going to do this <laughs> and this and you're not going to be able to stop me. All right. Two great, uh, two great who's on uh, three questions. Again, fusionmedstaff.com. Last thing we do on the show, ladies, is the parting shot. All right, Parting Shot brought to you by our friends from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. Excited that CSM is coming up. A lot of great content uh, in the orthopedic section at CSM. They've also got some great content online right now. How about uh, current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy? That's that perfect roadmap to take you from wherever you are in your career to something like an OCS or just improve your orthopedic game. Uh, they just came up with the fifth edition, so it quite literally is the current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy. And they have an option now. This is brand new. You can uh, you can buy the, the whole current concepts, or if you just want to focus on upper quarter or lower quarter, you can divide and conquer or get the whole thing. Whatever you want to do. Put it in your stocking this, uh, this season. Uh, orthopt.org. So parting shot, uh, ladies. Kate, we'll have you go first since you've done this before. It's just your last chance for a mic drop moment. Whatever sentiment or idea or thought you'd want to leave with the audience as we wrap up. Kate, you go first. Uh, all right. My parting shot for today would have to be uh, I genuinely did not realize how easy it was to get on my own way. Um, mostly because, again, I'm a details and logistics and fine, like precise, fine combing type person. Um, and so for those of you who are like me, more of the like very, very precision minded have a harder time doing the big broad strokes kind of thing. 
take a risk and do the big broad strokes kind of things every so often. They're less scary than they seem. And they'll let you actually use the logistics in a way that, I don't know, lets you accomplish something instead of just getting stuck there, writing a book chapter that nobody's ever going to do. Yeah. Do the thing. Do the thing. Do the thing. Do I the mean, I had a boss in radio who was like, uh, "Listen, if your radio shucks, uh, if your radio show sucks and no one's listening, I mean, did you fail in front of anybody? Because no one's listening. Who cares? Just well, there you it. go. It's a, it's a lower the bar for yourself. All right, gamer talk. No pressure, but you get to wrap up the episode with your parting shot. Uh, you know, in the line of Gary V, give less craps about what other people think of you, and that's really easy to say. And when when people are saying negative things about you, you say rub, rub them, brush them off, brush them off. But it comes from not letting people hype you up, right? You have to have validation from within. You have to not let people get you so high when you have accomplishments and when you're doing good things and when life is going well. Because if people can bring you up, they can bring you down. Uh, validation should come from how you feel about yourself and introspection and not how other people feel about you. So yeah, when you, when, when you detach that things, you know, he, he's like the higher, the higher highs are, aren't as high, the yep, lower lows. He's like, exactly. you, when it comes from within, um, it's more genuine. Right. And he preaches yep. like, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't live your life for somebody else. Stop, wh stop buying shit. You don't need to impress yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. You, you don't. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. Why are you doing that? All why right. Uh, last thing I'll let you guys do. Uh, you, people should buy this book because why? Cause it's the first of its kind to talk about esports as a clinical topic in medicine and performance. Imagine there is no other book like this. There's none. There's this one. And imagine if you were around when orthopedic medicine was created. Imagine if you were there when the first person who wrote that book published that book. Like, like I, this is esports medicine is going to be a thing, right? It's going to be a, a, a multi million dollar industry in 10 years. And this is going to be on its third, fourth, fifth edition. And I will pay you a thousand dollars in 10 year for this copy. Show me a clip of this podcast. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, ladies, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, would love to have you back on uh, because this is a thing and it's going to be a bigger thing. And we're going to need to know more about the things. Uh, they say the best conversations happen at, at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours.